The last video we started talking about integration and integrability via this thing called the lower sum and the upper sum with respect to a certain partition. So let's recall some of those things real quick and then we're gonna dive into the notion of a refinement of a partition. So I don't have it written up here, but all along we wanna assume that F is a function from the closed interval A, B to the real numbers which is bounded. And then we say that P, which is a finite set of numbers, x0, x1, up to xn, and a subset of the interval AB is a partition of AB if x0 is equal to A, xn is equal to B, and then xi is less than xi plus 1. And that's going to be true for all appropriate i. So in other words, this is an increasing list of numbers that starts at A and ends at B, and it's a finite list. And the lower sum of f with respect to this partition p is going to be the sum i goes from 1 to n of little m i. And then we've got x i minus x i minus 1. And little m i is the infimum of the values of the function on the subinterval x i minus 1 to x i. So I haven't written that there, but you can check out the last video if you want to see the definition spelled out. And then similarly, UFP, or the upper sum of F with respect to P, is the sum over I going from 1 to N of capital MI, XI minus XI minus 1. And this capital MI is the supremum of our function F as it runs through all of those subintervals as well. We did an example in the last video that I'll let you guys check out if you want to. Okay, so now we want to introduce the notion of a refinement. So we wanna suppose that P and Q are both partitions of A, B. We say that Q is a refinement of P if P is a subset of Q. Okay, and so let's look at an example here. So this guy right here is a refinement of this guy right here. So notice this one has points one, three halves, two, four, five. This guy has all of those points, one, three halves, two, four, and five, but I've also included the points three and nine over two. So that makes this set a refinement of this set, or this partition of one comma five, a refinement of this partition of one comma five. And so how we wanna think about this is we're refining our study of the interval by chopping it up into more pieces. Okay. Good, so we wanna prove the following lemma, and that is if P is a subset of Q, in other words, if Q is a refinement of P, then the lower sum of F with respect to P is less than or equal to the lower sum of F with respect to Q. So in other words, if we refine the partition, we get a bigger than or equal to lower sum. That's all we're gonna prove, but it follows super similarly that the upper sum will get smaller. So here we've refined the partition P to turn it into the partition Q, and we've ended up with a smaller than or equal to upper sum. And this follows like exactly the same as the proof that we will do, just with some inequality switch. Okay, so let's maybe get to it. So here we're going to focus on one of the subintervals of P, and that subinterval will be, maybe we'll call it xi minus 1 to xi. So that's, again, a subinterval of A, B. So what that tells us is that the two points xi minus 1 and xi are inside of P, which is a subset of Q. So they're part of both partitions. Okay, now we're gonna proceed by induction on the number of points that are added to this partition P to turn it into Q. So let's maybe write that down real quick. So induction on number of new points introduced to Q. And I guess I should say that's on this specific subinterval. But if we're doing this for an arbitrary subinterval, then it's going to clearly extend to the whole partition. Okay, so let's maybe look at our base case. So our base case will be um, Q contains one point 
that is between xi minus one and xi. So let's maybe say there exists y, a single point in Q, such that y is on this open interval, xi minus one, xi. Great. So now we're going to look at the portion of the lower sum of f with respect to p versus the portion of the lower sum of f with respect to q as we're going over this subinterval. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. So notice that here we have m xi minus xi minus 1. Sorry, this should be mi. And here we're taking this mi to be the infimum of f of x as x goes on that interval xi minus 1 to xi. So those are par portions of a, the partition P. And there are no points in between xi minus 1 and xi that are inside of P. And so that's kind of um, underwritten into this setup. Okay, so that's our mi right there. Great. And then next, we can break this up into two pieces. So let's maybe break it up into two pieces like this. We'll write this as mi, and then we'll have xi minus y plus mi, and then y minus xi minus 1. And so that's pretty clear. We just added 0. The version of, we, of 0 we added was mi times y minus mi times y. Okay, cool. Now we're going to notice that this is less than or equal to something that I'll call mi prime times xi minus y plus mi double prime and then y minus xi minus 1. And what are these mi primes and these mi double primes? Well, this is going to be exactly the infimum on the newly created subintervals. So let's spell it out here. So mi prime is the infimum of f of x as x runs through the subinterval um, y up to xi. So that's like the top half of the subinterval. And then mi double prime is equal to the infimum of f of x as x runs on the bottom of that subinterval. So xi minus 1 up to y. Great. And so how do we know that this inequality holds? Well, that's because it's clear that this mi prime and this mi double prime are bigger than or equal to this mi. But next, I want to notice that this is part of the lower sum of f with respect to the partition p. And then this over here is part of the lower sum of f with respect to the refinement q. And if we repeat this process over all subs, such subintervals, so here we're only focused on one subinterval, but if we continually repeat this over all subintervals, we'll still have this inequality. And so what we've shown is that if we add zero points or one point to each of the subintervals to refine P into Q, then this inequality holds because we have the inequality happening on each of the subintervals. So now I'm going to clean up the board from here down and then we'll make an induction hypothesis and then do the induction step, which will finish this off. Okay, so we proved our base case. Now we're ready to make an induction hypothesis. So I want to suppose that this statement holds on this subinterval xi minus 1 to xi if k points are added. So let's say those k points are maybe y1 through yk. So in other words, we've got xi minus 1 is less than y1, which is less than y2, all the way up to yk, which is less than xi. Good. And then next, I want to consider the case if k plus 1 points are added. So suppose a new point is added. And maybe we'll call this point z. It'll just be a little bit tricky if we call it um, z or 
It'll kind of be needlessly tricky if we call it y sub k plus one because we don't know exactly where it is going to fall. So this is just some new point, which is between xi minus one and xi, but it is not one of the yj's. So it's not one of those. Okay, good. So what that tells us is that this z is going to be between two of these yj's. So we can write it like that. z is going to be between um, y uh, j minus one and y j, like that. Okay, good. But now let's go ahead and, but now we can simultaneously apply our induction hypothesis as well as the base case to finish this off. So we know that mi times xi minus xi minus one. So that is going to be less than or equal to the sum of all of the mi primes over this. So let's maybe think about how to write that. So that's going to be equal to the lower sum over f of this partition of the interval xi minus one to xi, and that partition is given by xi minus one, y one, all the way up to yk, and then xi. So notice that is the partition of this interval. Okay, good, again, that is by our induction hypothesis. But now we know if we add a single point to that, then we'll also have the correct inequality. And that is because of the base case. Our base case was involving adding just a single point. So we know that this is going to be less than or equal to LF. And then I'll write this as XI minus one, Y one, all the way up to XI. And then I'm gonna union that with my new point Z. So that's my refinement of this partition of this little piece right here by a single point. But now notice that is in fact the induction step because we have this thing right here, which is mi that infimum times xi minus xi minus one is less than or equal to this object right here, which is adding k plus one points between xi minus one and xi. But since this is happening in, on an arbitrary subinterval, then that means this kind of thing is true over all of the subintervals, finishing off this inequality. Okay, we're gonna finish this video off with a short proof of a companion lemma. So we just showed that if we took a refinement of a partition, we made the lower sum potentially larger and we made the upper sum potentially smaller. So now we, what we wanna prove is that the lower sum is always smaller than or equal to the upper sum, and that is regardless of which partition you're using for each lower sum and each upper sum. So in other words, for any two partitions, P1 and P2 of the interval A, B, we have the lower sum of F with respect to P1, is less than or equal to the upper sum of f with respect to p2. So I want to maybe point out the following fact, which will be true regardless of which partition you take, and that is that the lower sum of f with respect to a partition p is less than or equal to the upper sum of f with respect to the same partition p. So this doesn't require any proof, because notice how we define the lower sum and the upper sum. The lower sum and the upper sum have almost the same definition, but this one is using the infimum of the function. This one is using the supremum of the function, but by definition, the infimum is always less than or equal to the supremum. They're only equal if the function is constant or something. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and use that fact along with this first lemma to prove our second lemma. So let's go ahead and take Q to be equal to the union of P1 and P2. And what I want to notice is that Q is a partition of AB. 
Remember, all it takes to be a partition is a finite set of the interval a, b that starts at a and ends at b. But definitely if you union two partitions, you're gonna, gonna get a partition. So sometimes this is called the common refinement of p1 and p2. And we can see that because p1 is a subset of q and p2 is also a subset of q. And let's go ahead and point out that this is sometimes called the common refinement of P1 and P2. And in fact, it's the smallest refinement of P1 and P2 that contain P1 and P2. Um, okay, good. So now, now we're essentially done, we just need to write it down. So let's go ahead and look at the left-hand side of this. So we've got the lower sum of F with respect to P1. We know from our first lemma that that is gonna be less than or equal to the lower sum of F with respect to Q because Q is a refinement of P1, but that's gonna be less than or equal to the upper sum of F with respect to Q because of that fact up there, given that one is defined in terms of the infimum and one in terms of the supremum. But now this is gonna be less than or equal to the upper sum of F with respect to P2. And that's from the other version of this limit, which we didn't prove, but it follows like almost identically to the one that we did prove. But now looking at the extreme left and right hand side of this inequality, we see that we have established this lemma. And that's a good place to stop.